Welcome to the first episode of the Thai Pilot Podcast. We appreciate you tuning in. This is going to be a semi-regular podcast for the pilots of the corps, hosted by the two of us, covering topics of interest to us all. In the future, we hope to have additional guests. I'm Lieutenant Commander Jack Winnen. I'd like to introduce my co-host, Zach Tarek. Today, we're going to be giving a refresher briefing on how to survive an atmospheric ejection. Everyone went over this in basic training, but seeing as how we'll be going to the unknown regions and facing down unfamiliar foes and exploring strange planets, it's good to make sure everyone is up to date. We'll be using Aurora as an example now. Despite being well colonized, Aurora still has plenty of untamed wilderness. Dense, lush forests dominate much of the planet's surface, and there can be considerable distance between populated settlements. Furthermore, away from the bastions of order, there is no shortage of Auroran nationalist elements, eco-terrorists, and predatory creatures that you should be mindful of. My co-host, Zek, will be going over food and water procurement first. Hello, everybody, and uh, like we said, thanks for tuning in. I'm Colonel Zek Terrett, Commander of Sin Squadron. Um, now, of course, every TIE pilot's craft is stuffed with a basic emergency ration kit to help you last, you know, a day, two days, three days. And that should include a flameless heater, heater for you to cook your food with. Of course, if you are a member of the finest squadron in the TIE Corps, Sin Squadron, your TIE Sinister will have much more cargo space. And ideally, you should be planning for every scenario. So stuff that cargo space and with every tool imaginable that you think you could need to survive. Now, when you're stationed in orbit around Aurora or indeed any planet, you will be given a very basic briefing about the regularly encountered flora and fauna. Pay attention to it because this can save your life. After an atmospheric ejection, you'll want to know what animals and plants are poisonous. And consult your field manual for atmospheric survival on how to properly dress a kill, assuming it's a quadruped or biped that hasn't tried to eat you yet. With any luck, you ejected near where your ship crashed, and some systems may still be working, even if the flight engine or if the engine or flight controls are not. This can be used for shelter. And you could also salvage parts from it that you need, perhaps an air conditioning system or, at the very least, the TIE Sinister's signature cup holder. Now, you do have your basic emergency ration kit, and you may not be lucky enough to be a member of Sin Squadron, so you will not have the extra space for food, so you're going to have to procure your own when you run out. First off, if you didn't pack a blaster or some kind of weapon before getting into your ship, that's your own fault. Only a rebel would be that stupid, so you deserve to die out there. Since you are likely alone, it would be wise to avoid large predators and concentrate on smaller game until you can find help. Consult the field manual for instructions on how to dress a kill if you haven't already. Remember to always remove the skin first. Keep it around. You could use it. Don't waste any part of the animal, especially the fatty parts. Now, if your flameless heater runs out, you're eventually going to want to cook it, right? Hopefully you'll still have it around, but if not, we'll go over a couple ways to start a fire in the wilderness. Number one is the hand drill. It's a very primitive method and the hardest to do. This is something that a rebel would do, being completely unprepared. The first thing you want to do is make a tinder nest. The tinder nest is necessary to be utilized to make the fire you get in the flash you're going to make. Tinder nest can be made out of things out of things that burst into flames effectively, such as dry leaves, grass, and bark. What you would do is make a little notch in the tenderness, cut an angular notch on your fireboard, and create a dip near it. Place bark below the V-shaped cut. The bark is utilized to get a coal from the erosion between the axle and the fireboard. Then you take your hand drill and you start spinning. You place the shaft into the notches on your fireboard. Your shaft should be around two feet to work well. Keep weight on the fireboard and start to roll the shaft in your hands rapidly down the axle. Hopefully you still have your flight gloves because this is going to hurt. Continue doing this until the ember is framed on the fireboard. After you've done that for, you know, a long time, hopefully you will have started a fire. When you see a shining ember, tap the fireboard to place your ember onto the bit of bark. Exchange the bark to your nest of tinder and slowly blow on it to get yourself some fire. One more, the fire plow. You would set up a fireplace and cut a notch in its place. You would rub, take the head of your shaft and place it ready on the fireboard. Begin to rub the tip of the shaft all over the notch. This should start a fire. You need to have your nest at the end of the fireboard so you'll pull ember into it as you're rubbing. 
when you get ember, drop it on the nest and blow it gently to get your fire going. Now, we will discuss certain ways to find water. You should have somewhat of a water supply on board your ship. Uh, and if you're lucky enough to fly a tie sinister, you'll have a lot of room for several gallons of water. And you won't be listening to this part of the podcast. But if, you know, you could be in a row squadron and flying a tie interceptor, you won't have a lot of room for water. So you're going to need to learn how. So how would you find water in the wild? Well, you would start with the obvious streams, rivers, and lakes. So what are certain ways you could do it? Well, the first is common sense. Stand perfectly still and listen. You might be able to hear running water, even if it's a great distance away. Remember, you are in the wilderness and it's quite quiet out there. Next, um, you'd want to use your eyes to try to find animal tracks or insect swarms. These could lead to water in the mornings and evenings, especially you could follow the flight paths of birds. Not to mention the fact that water generally runs downhill. So you would want to go into valleys, ditches, that sort of thing. Um, collecting rainwater. Uh, it's one of the safest ways to get hydration without the risk of bacterial infection, especially true in wild rural areas. Um, there are two primary methods of collecting rainwater. Um, you're going to want to salvage any containers you might have on you, um, breaking apart your crashed ship that you hopefully ejected near. Uh, will definitely help you with this. Um, secondly is to use, uh, tie the corners of a poncho or tarp, um, which you probably got from your injection seat, around trees a few feet off the ground, where you would then place a small rock in the center to create a depression and let the water collect. You can combine these methods and make your containers more effective by tying the poncho or tarp to funnel into your bottle or pot or whatever you have, as long as it doesn't overflow and waste water. You would also want to do things like collect heavy morning dew um, in much the same way uh, by tying some absorbent clothes or cloths or tufts and fine grass around your ankles or whatever and take a pre-sunrise sunrise walk through tall grass and meadows and that sort of thing and then wring out the water when the clothes are saturated and repeat. Just be sure you're not collecting that dew from any poisonous plants. Hopefully you paid attention to your briefing, pilot. Uh, and another reason you should pay attention to your briefing is so you know what fruits and vegetation to eat. Uh, things such as fruits, vegetables, cacti, pulpy plants, and even roots contain a lot of water. Uh, with any of these, you can simply collect the plants and put them into some kind of container and smash them with a rock to collect their liquid. It won't be much, but uh, in desperate situations, every little bit helps, and we need you alive to uh, get back to work killing rebels. So with that out of the way, I will turn things over to Lieutenant Commander Jack Winnan. We will bring you up to speed on nationalist terror groups of Aurora, eco-terror groups, and dangerous animal species and how to deal with them. So when dealing with terror groups, the first thing you want to do is avoid contact where possible. The nationalists in particular will attack you because anything imperial is essentially the antithesis to what they stand for. They want to be left alone as a general rule and if they even interpret a behavior as interfering with that, they will come out guns blazing. Now the upside to that is they tend not to be versed in imperial tactics. So you have that on your side, but many of the older members are veterans of Auroran Wars, so they have their own knowledge in fighting other bipedal creatures. As for eco-terrorists, they're a little more unpredictable. Their goals are essentially focused around protecting the environment from what they view as a threat on the part of the Emperor's Hammer. The issue with this is, despite their overall noble ideology, is they tend to use violent means to achieve it. Much like the nationalists, you want to avoid them where possible, as the more extreme factions will associate anything imperial, including a black uniform worn by a TIE pilot, as inherently dangerous, and they will attack you. They tend not to have the same kind of training that the nationalists might, since veterans of Auroran conflicts do not associate with them as readily as some might with nationalists. As for dangerous animals, there are two categories. 
They're going to be large predators. They include creatures such as the auroran jaguar or, or various kinds of bears. With bears, it varies. You want to stay away, under all circumstances, stay away from any cubs. If you get near a bear cub, you're screwed. The mom's going to come after you, claws out, and will probably tear you apart. For, for smaller threats, you have your snakes, spiders, anything really venomous. For snake bites, you want to try and get away from the snake apply an immobilization bandage, and ideally, if you still have your first aid kit on you, you should apply some Bacta. That'll keep you alive, hopefully until a trained medic can get to you. That wraps up this survival briefing. Hopefully this refresher has everyone a bit up on to speed on how to get through the time between ejection and rescue. Our venture into the unknown regions will be quite a trial by fire for many of us. While it would be ideal if none of us actually have to use these skills, being able to properly make use of them can and will save your life if you find yourself stuck on the ground on a wild planet. All right, everybody, that's a wrap. I appreciate you guys tuning in to the first episode of the Thai Pilot Podcast. Uh, like we said, we will be doing it semi-regularly as often as we can. Um, we hope to have some super important guests uh, in the future. and. Uh, issues or topics of interest to Thai pilots. And uh, yeah, this is Colonel Zach Terry signing off. Everybody have a good night. Have a good night, everyone. Signing off.